so let's tell you, Mads, a little bit about you. We'll tell everyone here. So Mads is, let me get started on this absolutely incredible bio from this woman. She is an award-winning tech entrepreneur. She's a startup mentor. Uh, she was a 2020 Amazon Services Web Scout. She's an angel investor, a board director, the founder of what is actually one of Australia's, if not the world's, leading career education and employability skills platforms, Future Amp. We're going to get right into that today because this is a super exciting conversation about the future of work. Mads is also the founder and CEO of Girl World, uh, which is a platform that's connected hundreds of global industry mentors with female high school students to upskill them. You're also qualified in design thinking and innovation. So we're going to riff a little bit on some of the inside, outside, inside organizations as well. Uh, and you are an ex journo and the co-host of the Human Cogs podcast, not to mention being a mum of four. Phew. <laughs> Don't believe everything you read. I think if you mashed up anyone's life into a bio, it always sounds like a lot, doesn't it? But we all have different energies and, and buckets of time that we deliver to each of those things. So yeah. I'm happy to chat you through what that looks like, the way that I actually design and divide my life across those spheres. Yes, we are super excited to hear about some of that as well. Tell us, let's dive into Future Amp. I'd love to kind of start there around this conversation. So you've created this really incredible platform. It's based on challenging what's going on right now in the future of work. Tell us all about it. Sure. So Future Amp is a proprietary global um, education technology platform. Yeah. Um, the problem we're looking to solve is that education is not keeping up with Industry 4.0 or let alone 5.0. So where we see a lot of the movement in market around, particularly through COVID, we've seen really hyper disruption of industries. We've got emerging industries growing. And what we're seeing actually is that Australia doesn't have a skilled workforce, like current workforce. So there's a lot of programs going on internally to try and reskill or upskill people to meet those new needs of market. Um, and what we see if we push back into education pipeline is that students actually aren't getting the skills they need either to demonstrate core competencies to come up and transition into those future pathways. Yeah. So at a high level, that's what FutureAmp's trying to solve. And the reality is it's a full stack um, platform that's been built from spec on Amazon Web Services. We have built the entire product in the last four months. Yep. Um, we've been working yeah. hard and we've got a great <laughs> development team. And we're standing up the beta version of that product in about 10 days. Mm. Um, now, what the product is delivering is in a rapidly shifting global workforce and we've got students trying to make those decisions about their tertiary or vet or straight to workforce pathways. Yeah. What we're bringing then is e-learning where they can develop skills use, and get micro-credentials on the fly. Um, they can do virtual work experience. So what might it look like to go inside a company and look around and meet the people so you can make a better decision around is that the kind of company I'd like to work for? Is that mm. where my passions lie? Um, because a lot of students, there's a high attrition rate out of courses or jobs because people get in there and go, oh, this is actually nothing like I thought it was because they're not making that informed decision. So we're really trying to bridge that gap to get students kind of inside the world of work virtually before they make decisions about their subjects, courses or pathways. Um, and then we also have lots of industry mentors in there. So hundreds of videos that we filmed inside freaking awesome companies around the world like Airbnb, Atlassian. Microsoft, you know, front end, real front wave tech companies through to all sorts of other technical industries. So that again, students can really meet the human first, understand what's the job you do, what does your day to day look like, what are the skills you're using, and what was your pathway. And that way, you know, if we start from story and that human interaction, it's a much better way for the student to then shape their own thinking as they emerge into their career decision making. So Future Amp has got a team of nine at the moment. We've hired actually through COVID, which has been really interesting, um, you know, that sort of virtual hiring process. And, um, you know, we're tracking well and all good to uh, with our go to market for the back end of this year. And the back end of the year is a bit of a sandbox. So it's where we're going to really test and learn and refine our UX and our offering to, to our core users, which is students, but also our customer experience, and that is our offering to schools and education um, sector where we're selling the platform into them. So it's a B2B model. Um, wow. It's a big national, like, big footprint kind of model. Uh, mm. And so we've come at it from the outset thinking we want to be the dominant career education offering in market because it's a smart platform. We can pull really rich data insights off the back end and it's highly personalised for the user, which is a lot of the problem with existing offerings is it's not personalised or customised. And so it's not really doing a good job for anyone. Yeah. 
Wow. Okay. Talk to us a little bit about the B2B model. Why are you deciding to do that? So rather than going to schools, for example, where you could or direct to even students, tell us what the model is and how you're going to have that bigger impact. Sure. Um, so we're really working on a partnership model. So where we look at education, it's sort of divided certainly in the Australian market into three sectors. There's the public, there's Catholic, and then there's the independ- independent sector. And so um, through our previous business, Girl World, we were very much delivering a school-to-school kind of model. There were some major events where we'd partner with universities, but for the most part, we were doing our, you know, a, a direct service model into schools or institutions with FutureAmp because we can get the scale. Um, through the platform where you've still got a high personalization, but we can get that scale and reach with um, with users. It's a partnership model whereby we will partner with key um, industry sectors or with government where we can then scale the product out to a particular demographic or geographic and then pull some really great data insights around the efficacy of the product, the learner progress, and then some of the predictive analytics around the pathway choices for those students. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's really, really powerful. So we have already, we had an MVP we launched earlier this year before we decided to build the whole platform uh, from the ground up, as you do. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the MVP we launched um, was in partnership with Victorian State, State Government with DJPR. And we built some online learning programs for the Gippsland region of Victoria, uh, because specifically we could see there was a STEM deficit there. And so we could build highly customised programs, point the fire hose toward those users or that direction um, and really deliver to that need. Um, And so that's where we've got the power of a platform like this where we can snap to fit and point the hose and personalise toward the huge variance that sits across education because education in Australia is not equitable, unfortunately. Um, And we see some really... Um, some real problems up into New South Wales, for example, with Aboriginal students, you know, low completion rates for year 12. So what might it look like if we coupled into our platform, partnering with an Aboriginal curriculum designer and provider, some content that will highly customise that learner and user experience for those particular kids with a cultural need? Um, Or what might it look like where we send um, it out into community in a remote, regional or rural area where they're just not getting access to some of the big city industries? Um, and show them what it looks like to participate in a global economy uh, and take them out of that small town frame of reference. So that's what's super exciting about um, designing a scalable but personalised model. Yeah. Talk to us a bit about going back, you just mentioned, you know, January we've done our minimum viable product. This is, you know, really early days. The, the idea for you, how long had it been kicking around? When did you, when did you come up with this? Well, as we know, there's no overnight success in startup. Um, you know, from the back of a napkin to all the nights and days and shower screen sketchings and all the rest, including actually those post-its on the back wall, I think they've been up for two years. So, um, it, look, it's probably my co-founder, Edwina Kolomansky, and I, we co-founded Girl World together. And Girl World is a similar company, albeit a different business model in that we're trying to solve for connecting girls with industry mentors, you know, developing those leadership, entrepreneurship and innovation skills and getting them fit for the future of work. Um, but so, so we've had a chance to roll around the problem and really learn to deeply get the pain that sits inside, um, inside the problem. And so really we sketched the concept way back at the end of 2016 when we were um, doing a Master of Entrepreneurship. Uh, that's where we met actually and launched Girl World out of that. And we always had this idea that we wanted to find a way to develop a, te- a scalable technology solution, but that was smart and personalised. And I think we wouldn't be where we are today without the learnings we've had through Girl World in access to market and customers and users um, to understand their worldview, you know, standing yeah. inside the shoes of, of the user. So you really get their vantage point is, is one of the absolutely key things um, for delivering an awesome customer experience. Um, but I think uh, we've probably really accelerated our path to market from about September last year. So Future Out was accepted into the University of Melbourne's Innovated program, which is an ed tech. Mm, so it's not an accelerator as such. It's a program to just support you to have access into the university and enterprise to test your you know, your idea or your product or service at an early stage. Um, so we got into that and then we got into the David Gonski um, Future Minds Accelerator this year and David Gonski, of course, did the wholesale uh, federally commissioned investigation into education in Australia and found that, unfortunately, it was failing in lots of areas and needed to lift itself. And so the Future Minds Accelerator, the thesis or the mission for that is to find companies that are upskilling today's students for the jobs of tomorrow. 
And so that was right in our wheelhouse. Um, we were you know, one of 14 startups around Australia that got into that amazing accelerator uh, backed by Amazon Web Services. And we've been able to really ramp up our productivity. We've run faster than we probably would have mm -hmm. on our own, uh, but we've you know, really built our product, built our team, built our market position, got all those deep insights and access points we need to education, government and industry to put ourselves in a position now to be able to deliver a product that will, I'm sure, have creaks and clunks in it. Like, who, who was it? Reid Hoffman, I think, said, if you're not embarrassed with your first product, then <laughs> you've, you've waited you haven't moved quick enough. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So hopefully, um, yeah, there's a lot of great learning and testing that will go on across the back end of this year, but it's been an incredible experience um, you know, in learning about how to build a company, you know, on people first, you know, and product second and profit third. Love. Um, I, I want to get into that a little bit more, what you're talking about around these challenges this year in particular. I saw a great quote the other day that was, you know, for most people or most businesses, COVID is going to be an accelerator of one or two things. It's going to accelerate success or it's going to accelerate failure. Um, for you, it's been, you are one of the optimistic stories. You're one of the really positive stories where you've seen growth. You just mentioned nine people being hired in Future Amp. So I would imagine that the MVP that you came up with in January might be a little bit different to what we're going to be launching at the end of this year or what we're going to be doing. Tell us a bit about this journey in between. What have, what have been some of the challenges? And maybe what have a few of the things that have been on your side as well? Mm -hmm. So the journey to launching the MVP, that work really started late last year with uh, a couple of local developers. We, we made a call early on that whilst it can sometimes be more expensive to build locally, at least you're in the, in the room. And at that point, we were lucky enough to be actually in the room together pre-COVID, uh, which is super important at that early stage of, um, you know, all the journey mapping and the deep work you need to do to understand who you're actually building for and why. And that prioritisation framework and early decision making is, is the the death or life of a company, to be honest, because in startups you're you're taking it, an idea to execution. Um, you know, there's there's an absolute mushroom cloud of things that need to happen to establish a company. You would know that running your own company, and so that early prioritisation um, and working closely to make sure the communication was was really uh, fluid and transparent between ourselves and the development team was was fundamental. So, standing up the MVP, uh, we sort of rushed that into market a bit as well, but then most MVPs are, let's get it up and out, you know, before we had a chance to polish the wheels. Um, that was because COVID hit in March and we had a number of projects that we were delivering for the Victorian state government um, that were in the real and we had to pivot very quickly to a digital model. So it forced us to accelerate standing up that MVP to deliver those online learning programs. And we watched very closely, we kept that feedback look feedback loop very, very close through the early days and weeks of launching that product and did a bunch of customer insight interviews with both students and educators to understand, we were like, tell us the hard things. Like, tell us what's really ugly and terrible about this product and tell us where awesome, you know, what does awesome look like and got them to lead us toward. Um, sometimes I think it's hard uh, to get people to articulate exactly what they want um, but through those insight, those just customer discovery um, interviews and then through looking at our back-end data, so we built it so that we could get some really rich insights around completion rates, um, actual, you know, qualitative feedback where they would input different fields around mm. what they liked or didn't about certain features. That was really, really important um, so that we didn't leap to that assumption that we know so many of us do in the process of creating and ideating um, and really make sure we're led by our, our users. Um, so the reason we shelved our MVP is when we got to a point where we realised we had validated that we had some proof points around the user experience that were worth doubling down on, we didn't feel the initial build um, would satisfy our what we had in mind for scale to use it and also it was the way we've built this current platform is we've stitched together best in breed of you know third party kind of offerings there's some proprietary build in our stack but we've brought together best of breed because we've built it to last so it's kind of got a tesla back engine if you like um, and toyota out the front and that's fine because the toyota can turn into a tesla once we get our users uh, crawling all over it and inside it um, but we've really taken a strong intent to build a really great company and great product because of the learnings around what truly Scrappy looked like last time. 
Does that answer yes, your question? Totally does. And exactly as you're saying, like you can't really test this thing until it's actually out there and it's in the hands of users. Like that's going to be the nature of the product itself. It's got to be used by by your customers. Exactly. And we are, you know, we're pre-product and we're pre yeah. we're pre-revenue in the company, yeah. but we're about to go nuts and um, get it out there. And we've lined up pilots in Australia, New Zealand, and APAC, so we can get really extreme users mm. across that bell curve all over the product and then have different buckets of insights that we'll bring together and synthesise around how we then need to deliver to those markets for user specificities. Um, and so our, our thinking changed through the process of leading up to our launch. It was like, yes, let's just go to market and sell, but actually we put a sandbox in between the sell um, so that we're still having conversations with, with customers and we believe we've got a cracking product to deliver to them, but we want to really spend some good time in the sandbox with our users at the end of this year before we then go into market fully in 2021. Yeah. So much good stuff in there. I want to just touch on, you've talked, it sounds like there's a lot of decisions that had to be made, you know, over the last few months about what's in, what's out, you know, are we bringing some of our legacy thinking from Girl World here? It's the same co-founders that are involved in both, which obviously has a lot of benefits, but also, you know, and, and being also somebody that understands the design process, has done innovation in a lot of different contexts, you know, how do you bring different voices in to help you make better decisions about the way that you should be running the business or the decisions you should make around the product? It's a really, it's a really great question. Um, I think Edwina and I realised early on we needed to bring another set of heads into the room. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, how do you become magnets? yourselves for great talent how you attract the talent you need to bring those those specialized pieces of um you know human talent into the room uh and also get the diversity of skills that you need um, to build a great company at an early stage um how do you sell your story and tell your story in order to attract that talent into the room that was something we we thought about as well early on i mean you're selling a north star really uh and whilst we've had you know we've had um We've had cash runway to, to actually pay people to come in. We're not just trying to sell a dream and say you can't eat while we all dream. Um, <laughs> it, it helps if you can pay. Eat the dream. Eat the yeah, dream. I mean, it, it helps if you can pay your people um, early on. But we really did recognise um, that we needed to bring some other people into the room, and particularly we were building a technology company and not, uh, you know, and not Girl World, which, which was different. So um, we're very open to we want to hear the hard things. In fact, you and I were riffing the other day. I'm just finishing reading um, The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz, which really is the nuts and bolts and war It's my most gifted book, that book. I love that. I've given that to, like, enterprise heads. Yeah, big plug for that book. So good. Whether you are entrepreneur, entrepreneur, leading a big company, leading a small company, so good. There's some nonsense in there too because it's it's extremely um, Silicon Valley startup, so they're yeah. more applicable to everything, but it's really, um, he just cuts the chase, doesn't he? Totally. And there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of sweaters and sneakers and bro. Yeah. <laughs> but that's okay because that's yeah. one read of, of startup. And I suppose yeah. as a female founder, you have, you know, you have to know when to lean in and listen to that stuff or yes. say what part of that is relevant to my particular my particular sort of leadership style or cultural story. Um, but we're a team, we're a really deliberately diverse team. Um, mm-hmm. And Edwina and I are now outnumbered by blokes actually in our, uh, in our team. Um, yeah. But we do think about that, that diversity deeply around, I mean, this surface diversity that we talk about when we think about neuro, neurodiversity and that skill specialization, that's really important because everybody who comes into an early stage company needs to absolutely pull their weight and be bringing a really clear set of articulated value to that table um, because you haven't got room for slush. Um, everyone has to bring a lot of like, a lot of fat into the company to put on the bones. And so we have we have made some hires in the past through both companies um, where we probably didn't do enough DD on getting the right cultural fit or skill fit. Um, and so we've actually changed our hiring processes quite a lot um, to make sure that we're really getting deeply to the human inside before we bring them into into the formalised um, hiring process. And that includes trying to understand what actually motivates you. Tell us about this. This is, I'm so curious because I'm not, anyone who's in a team or leading a team is going to want to know about this. How are you doing that? How is it different to what you did before? Tell us all about it. 
Yeah, so I think it's different because we, we're daring to go deeper early on so we don't mm-hmm. suddenly discover the human inside once they're actually in the team and go, oh, whoops, that's not going to work okay in this dynamic or whatever. Uh, we're giving them a chance to see who we are, how we work, how we think as well so that they can then make their own rightful assessments to whether they want to give up their time and value set to our company. I think, um, you know, it, it's a big it's a big investment of people to want to jump on board a company when it's moving fast and uh, you're not quite sure where the car is going. Um, some people can't can't sit with that level of uncertainty or uncomfortability and so it probably would be fair to say that the people we hire in have entrepreneurial tendencies if they haven't founded companies that they're comfortable with the messiness that is startup and the excitement that is startup and the autonomy they're offered in startup because, of course, if the company starts getting pace and, and putting more people in the car, then you're going to get a chance to really shape the position you hold in that company if, you, mm. if, if, if you're working well. So what we look for uh, is high autonomy. Mm-hmm. Uh, we look for high emotional intelligence because moving fast uh, and moving with uncertainty, there is an emotional tax around that uh, and you have to do a lot of check-ins with yourself to check that you're managing your, your stress and comfortability levels with learning new things all the time. Yep. Um, we also look for really awesome communication skills and that's not just being able to spin up an air table or a Gantt chart, that is actually can we get through this hard moment or this challenge and let's actually see what that looks like. Um, And we've been using this recently actually as part of our hiring. What is it? It's a fabulous little box of cards from the School of Life Mm. called Teamwork. The the idea is it's uh, you do these exercises in an established team, I imagine, to build um, better team dynamics. But what they are are a set of little provocations, a bit like... um, uh, some of those, what are those, Cards Against Humanity and that sort of oh, thing, yeah. but not quite as wrong as those. <laughs> um, and so there's some really fabulous mm. questions that seem benign, but actually people reveal an enormous amount about themselves. And so here's a couple of examples. Do you want a few questions? Yeah. Are we doing these in the interview process or this is when the team is in the test? Nice. Let's go. Well, Let's hear some. We're going to throw in some wild cards <laughs> and people usually look slightly startled. They say, don't worry, you don't need to give us anything, you know, that you don't want to tell us, but we'd love to understand more about the human inside rather than just the CV or what you've done. So here's some questions like, what are you passionate about? Mm -hmm. Uh, What about, um, who are you in the world of biscuits? Oh, that's a good one. Sounds like a benign question. It's not. a great question. They can reveal really interesting things like, I think I'm an Oreo because I'm pretty black and white. I'm pretty binary the way I work. And if things aren't kind of in layers, I don't work well. It's like, boom, bingo. There we go. There's a really great insight. What about if you were a colour? What colour would you be? Mm. And usually yeah. people bring some inference there into their leadership style. Really? Yep. And whether they're an optimist or a pessimist is usually in, in some sort of think that, that they'll attribute to happy or sadness or their emotional levers. So really is it as obvious as kind of yellows and blacks or like is there a okay. bit of an Edward de Bono hats thing going on there as well? The color yeah. that they mentioned no. people go like straight to well actually the other thing is you, you have to answer pretty quickly. You're not allowed to have yes. like too much thinking you. time. The yep. biscuit one's gold. I'm loving that. I'm gonna keep that one. Yep. And here's a good one. What's the difference between and particularly during COVID where we see the complete disruption of our kind of um, you know the suited workforce and we've all gone back into our homes and revealing something about ourselves what's the difference between your home self and your work self and how Mm -hmm. might your colleagues or people around you be surprised love and uh what have been the biggest surprises that people have come back with with these questions well ones that you can share without their names this one we use without using names this is a cracker and I would carry, I mean, one of the things we've been doing in our team meets to try and humanise what it feels like yeah. to be in a Zoom room all day, which we all know is exhausting and, mm. and one-dimensional to, to a large extent. We're not getting that feedback loop, that sensory human dynamic that often informs yeah. our intuition around decision-making or, or mm. relational um, dynamics. This is a great one. Yeah. Complete this sentence without thinking about it too much. In order to really understand me, you have to know that. Oh, God. Do you want me to do it? Yeah. In order to really understand me, you have to know that. Oh, 
that I'm a lover, I was going to say. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a good one. And what, what was a big surprise that you got there? So what we got is that people went really deep, really fast and said, in order to really understand me, you have to know that my grandfather or blah person in my life um, had this terrible experience or this this particular challenge and that has really shown up in the schema of my every day and why I bring myself to work because mm-hmm. I want to change that story or create some new pathway for myself. So really going big on what are all those meta factors and those stories that we're telling ourselves or that we're inheriting that are informing the way we, we show up into our every day, not just mm-hmm. in work but in life. And so... Um, It's really, I mean, I suppose you don't want to do this to disarm people or make them feel exposed and you have to do it in the context of a trusting team environment. Yeah. And so I wouldn't probably put that question out, you know, in it where you're trying to facilitate it with a group, you know, at a board level or something like that. Mm. Um, But I think it's a really powerful question to try and get um, an understanding of who's who's sitting inside the person showing up. And I think where we talk about, you know, is it intrinsic or extrinsic motivation um, that is really driving that person and so where we think about extrinsic motivation are they motivated to perform because there's a fear-based kind of just there or they want a reward or they think they're going to be punished inside a culture where you're not allowed to fail or try stuff or is it that they're intrinsically motivated for their own sake and their own personal rewards and they're deeply in touch with purpose and and are able to take something and run and feel responsible for that Mm. and they're really two different um different forces are these things that you've always followed really closely or do you feel like this has been a bit of an awakening for you because it feels very aligned with what you're doing at future amp as well i feel like a lot of you know not to generalize too much but even generationally if we think about your customer group of 15 to 25 year olds. And I feel like our current generation of 15 to 25 year olds are probably more in touch with their intrinsic motivators and their intrinsic desires for why they want to earn a living and the sorts of careers that they're looking for as well. Is that something that, you know, are these things sitting individually, how you're growing this team or are these things that are sort of coming into what you're doing at Future Amp as well? Um, I I think a bit of both, to be honest. Um, I think definitely I spoke earlier about, you know, we have to understand the worldview of the people we're serving. And we talk about 15 to 25-year-olds. And as a 48-year-old, I'm in no place to say that I I can learn as much as I can about what I think the world looks like, but we really need to understand how the world looks for them. They're the ones inheriting the issues of climate change, you know, of a global pandemic, of a black swan economy, of all these complex, wicked things that sit in our VUCA environment now, as they call it then it's really important that we understand um, how to help them work out what their pathway looks like. Where in Australia, for example, they're facing, you know, wide scale and disproportionate unemployment balanced against general population for that youth sector. Uh, We've got tertiary institutions at the moment all, um, you know, uh, questioning their relevance in a changing world where we're looking for practical plug and play kind of skills. We're seeing the rise of micro credentials and stackable education models. Um, and so there's a huge amount of shifting sands going on mm. for those people and so, um, <clears throat> or for that group rather, excuse me. And so um, so it's very important that we understand why they would want to uh, upskill themselves to move into a w- workforce to do what. Mm. And we see the rise of the purposeful organisation and the movement toward work that matters. I think we've moved on from widgets and, yeah. you know, um, and sort of spinning wheels and ping pong tables and all that sort of splash cash kind of business. And we're moving into the businesses that actually have an imperative to make the world better and to respect the humans who are inside that company. And we do know the next generation have very high affinity with those sorts of companies Mm -hmm. and they're directly trying to recruit into those pipelines. Yeah. And I think as well, I mean, within education, there's, a couple of questions in here because you must be looking at this all the time. And this is even from a personal perspective and a professional perspective. I want to know this, like what shakeups are coming? You know, we, I feel like it's been since I was at school, 2000, I left and everyone's been talking about BCE really being challenged and doing away with kind of existing structures. And, you know, is this actually going to be the catalyst what we've seen now, and I guess saw you post something recently about what is this actually going to mean for our schools now that they've had to 
shift to online learning. Tell us what, like, what is your prediction? Give us your, even, you know, Mads Grummet's crystal ball of what are we going to see in the next five years? All right. Well, even if it's your fantasy, that's okay. <laughs> what it's worth. Uh, you know, opinion, opinions are worth nothing unless we, you know, they're actualised, are they? Um, yeah. But I actually tuned into a really cool uh, lecture the other day uh, with Sanjay, can't remember his surname um, at the moment, but he's a professor at, MI, professor at MIT yeah. and he was part of the AFR. We're doing a series on reinventing education mm-hmm. and he gave a sort of a keynote and they had a number of leaders um, talking about what is actually changing across the tertiary scape. Uh, specifically. And what are some of the trends we're seeing? We're seeing the rise of micro-credentials, which I mentioned yep. before. We're seeing um, curriculum that uh, is uh, more designed by the student so they can, mm-hmm. they can mix their own curriculum uh, and so it's it's cross-disciplinary or inter- interdisciplinary and that's giving them a multi-lens approach uh, on the world. So that's, that's different rather than going through sort of verticals or one-track um, uh, course pathways we're seeing this rise of a high customization in education of mm. course what we've seen through COVID is this massive step change in the way learning teaching and learning is delivered yeah. uh, I personally believe that that needed to happen that actually education was calcified and a bit a bit sluggy yeah. and we hear about uh, an education system designed for the industrial age absolutely it was mm. and it's very densely packed so certainly in Australia where we see the curriculum, there's not enough cracks to let the light in to say, well, if we're actually truly going to connect students with the outside world or real problems to solve or industry, etc., then how, how do we actually shuffle over and create a bit of room for this stuff rather than just an ad hoc add-on? Yeah. So there's been some fundamental shifts. At a policy level, there's been some fundamental shifts. So we know that at a federal level now, universities across Australia have got a mandate that they must demonstrate employability skills in yeah. their graduating cohorts. How do you do that? without if they can't gain employment how do they get those skills Uh, so we're seeing this move toward work integrated learning uh, toward virtual solutions for virtual work experience such as what we're building Mm. and other companies and we're seeing education start to take off its shackles and recognize that what COVID has forced is there's an elephant in the room and it is that education needs to move faster be more agile deliver more personalization and actually take some more um, some richer insights around the user experience of education mm. so rather than a one-to-many model with an educator at the front of the room blasting out a fire hose of information what we know and part of what the MIT prof was talking about is there's a rise of micro learning mm. so we can only take in a certain amount of knowledge at once yeah. and embedding down that knowledge and stacking that knowledge so that we can then put it into practice that requires a, a real rethink and redesign of how we actually deliver education so not in a one-hour block Mm. actually in a 10-minute block where we allow synthesis, time to settle, time to practice, and then we move on to that next thing. And that requires a self-pacing that we've not also seen in education to date. And so what what this revolution um, that has occurred during COVID has offered is a chance to see what self-paced asynchronous learning looks like and how that's actually a much better user experience. Mm. I think that will be the major well, if people are prepared to double down on it uh, and not cling to the, you know, the currencies of old, um, I think that will be the major shift in education is this absolute hyper customization of the CX for the for the student. Yeah. Do you follow what they've done over at Victoria Uni? We had Trish McCluskey on from who was one of the creators of the block model at Vic Uni, and when they were seeing massive dropouts, um, student numbers were lower than most other universities and really struggling to compete to the point of, you know, questioning relevance and these sorts of things. And the block model has kind of become this, not invented by Vic Uni, invented by, I think, Kansas University and then bought to Vic Uni um, by this team and then modified for them. But that's that focus of that, you know, a concentrated focus on one topic, the ability to go deep, I think, is, is quite aligned with what we're also talking about in the workforce at the moment about giving people more time, you know, to be able to do that sort of deep work and dig right into a topic to that level of expertise rather than just jumping from thing to thing and, you know, multitasking is, yeah. Yeah, is yeah absolutely. And it's that whole um, theory of the deep T, you know, where yeah, exactly. value center out there, and giving people enough time. So, yeah. you know, maybe this is a good juncture to switch gear into where we think about um, companies committing to uh, innovation, for example. Yes. And so what we often see, or whether it's innovation or, or, or uh, 
per se for innovation's sake or yeah. a new idea or a new project. Someone's had a bright idea, the company decides to invest people or, or, or time or capital into that. And what we often see is there's not enough time actually or people clustered around it to, to go deep and to have the space the space to not just quickly spin up an output yeah. or, a, or a, a resolution or a, a recommendation. Where is the time and where do we value experimentation, yeah. play, Mm -hmm. the messiness that must sit in any process of innovation or anything new, uh, including inside a university where they're testing new um, learning delivery models, let's let's put enough oxygen in there to not jump to a very quick assessment of whether that thing worked or not. Yeah. We need to pull long data points, you know, really understand um, what it would take for the organisation to accommodate if there's a fundamental shift that's occurring around that delivery model. Um, yes. So there's got to be a bit more you know, well, risk-taking, I suppose, from leadership who say, if we can't pull a value metric on this thing right now, we will at least give it the space to, to prove or disprove yeah. that risk or experiment. Yeah. Um, and Or don't do it. Or don't do it, yeah. So, And if you're going to do it, then don't touch it and get in and hose out all the yes. fight. Yeah, which is exactly what innovation theatre is, is exactly right, and we could probably passionately, both of you and I, I know, believe this is where the bad rep comes from. It's the kind of the we're ready to start something and then beginning to commit and then just pulling the plug because something else comes along and it becomes the next focus. You know, it'd be interesting to hear as well because you, as I mentioned at the top of this, you know, I think you have a very unique experience, which is part of why I wanted to have this conversation of really doing it in both spaces. You have actually you know, you've studied design and innovation from some of the world's top orgs. You've also done your own little bit of design and innovation consulting. You've built your own company and you've worked in some of these organisations and seen it firsthand. But what do we think of the, from your perspective, the real shift that we need to see inside organisations to make it more real? That's a big question. Um, yeah, I've had, I mean, the re I've had the good fortune of sitting on both sides, as you say. Um, so I've trained with IDEO. Uh, I really love design thinking like the pure, uh, the pure model. I've also done D-School for the more, you know, uh, plug and play kind of model, which yeah. is great for, for students and if you want to get a quick and dirty kind of uh, design thinking model going. Yeah. Um, and also Inventium I've trained mm -hmm. with, which Amanda yeah. Imbu founded, and it's a much more science-based innovation. It's really a double diamond kind of model uh, that yeah. sort of converge um, or diverge converge. Um, so I've seen all sorts of innovation innovation toolkits and used with varying disease of, uh, degrees of um, success, disease. Freudian slip. Yeah, <laughs> disease of innovation. Um, and so, um, so I don't think it works well where you just bomb in like that seagull kind of approach where you just fly in some facilitators in colourful clothes and sneakers with a, with a suitcase full of post-its to make everyone get slappy and happy and clappy for a couple of days and we get to this great big moment of, you know, orgasm together and then everyone goes to bed. Um, excuse my crudity, but but often I think it can feel like that. So you get to this great height and then there's a really big so what at the end of it. So that was fun uh, and I'm exhausted and now I'm going to go away and go back to what I was doing every day and probably a bit worse because I'm pretty exhausted off the back of that diversion from my everyday work. So you've had no cultural shift no actual buy-in, no change to the dictates of the daily ways of working for that, that team or group, um, and no real buy-in because there's no metric or output that can be taken into the core and then pushed into the program of work and prioritised. Mm. So I think this is where we see this outside-in kind of model doesn't work very well. Yeah. We also see organisations, and I've worked inside one of the biggest organisations in Australia that had a dedicated innovation capability. And what we see is, so the, that model I just described was where you've got an organisation and then you just been this, this sort of outside in and they sit at the middle and they disappear and nothing's left. And then you see a big organisation that bolts on an innovation capability. They put it here, like a little planet next to it. They kind of zoom in and out, but they're a bit peripheral. They're different people. The people inside the company view them as like a bit fun, but a bit <laughs> weird. I don't really get what they do. And they might spin people up and out into sprints now and then. But again, we're not actually getting to the core. The leadership are not necessarily buying in. It's a nice thing to showcase and look at but it's not really a priority in terms, it's not sitting in the balance sheet as something that's, that's valued and needs to be proved. And then we see this third organisation that deep in its DNA here is embedded the, the innovation cell. Now, startups naturally have this, of course, because they start from a place of 
innovation or, or ideation and then we start clustering out from there. Their challenge is to make sure they build a robust structure around that nexus. Um, but where we have organisations that deeply commit, they embed it at the heart. It's, it's not just one function on the side and they push those processes, those, those think, you know, those thinking patterns, ways of working, they reward it right through the organisation. That's where I see it's done very, very well. Uh, it requires high trust from leadership, high risk-taking from the organisation broadly in the culture, and they celebrate experimentation. Mm -hmm. So if we think about what Google did with their 20% time, that's exactly what they did. They said, we trust the process enough to be, it's messy, we don't really want to look at it sometimes, but we trust that even if 0.01% of the experimentation brings us something of value, that that was worth doing because mm -hmm. otherwise you will have incumbents that just keep perpetuating the same calcifications in their cycles and wondering why they got left behind. Mm -hmm. So I think the innovator's dilemma is a great, have you read the innovator's yeah. dilemma? Yeah. Yes. So, you know, there's a great case in point there. I mean, the yeah. fundamental principle is you must be prepared to take that risk and take that leap in order to get the reward of innovation itself. And I, I don't, I mean, we're in a tricky time and the market's volatile and risk taking is a big deal right now where we see, you know, the pie the pie's kind of shrinking or stagnating in some mm. industries. And I understand why um, leaders would be feeling really worried um, about taking those risks right now to leap into new areas of, of growth or innovation. But we are not going to create the engines of our new economy. We're not going to find out what's beyond the next horizon um, of possibility and product services you know, climate change solutions, ways we're living, working, health, across yeah. all of our domains, unless we're, someone is willing to say, I am going to go toward the horizon, I have no idea what's on the, on the other side. Mm. I mean, but the only thing here, sorry. No, like, love it. <laughs> but I mean, even because you're talking about those two different types of organisations, and of course, even, you know, in the Innovators Dilemma, there's a lot of different, you know, different scales of organisations across that spectrum. But even the, in the example of Google, they're still one of those very unique organisations that, you know, started with that culture and then were able to maintain that culture even at the size that they were at. And I think I yeah. firmly believe, I do believe it's possible even for organisations who maybe didn't, you know, or have completely forgotten that to get it back if the CEO believes it's innovation is their responsibility. Exactly. That is where it needs to begin. It is yeah. like that is their job and especially right now, you know, it's, more than, and this is not even a conversation of self-interest, obviously this is the kind of work we do, but this is passionately believing that has there ever been a more critical time to be able to figure out, you know, what adjacent opportunities we should be looking at? You know, how yeah. can we make sure at all, you know, not every single person because we've still got to do the job, but who's keeping an eye on what is transformational and what could be out there, even if it's just to, about being acquisitive, right now you know this is for some organizations it could be a time to be more brave if they've got even just if they reorganize themselves in the right way it's not I, necessarily I about putting more capital against it yeah yeah i agree and it's that sort of um committing to curiosity to lifelong learning um, all these things we talk about that are fundamental to being able to see ourselves into this next horizon of, yeah. of workforce and um yeah there's been a lot of blinkers on I think, and COVID was this massive wake-up call for everybody because we suddenly got this seismic shock through our, you know, economy, society, you know, our, our health systems. And so um, that's tricky because we're living through a, a yeah. like literally a seismic step change. Usually things are more incremental than mm -hmm. that, I think. Um, there's a really cool uh, anecdote. There's a dude, um, David Foster Wallace, who told this famous kind of story that illustrates this in a commencement speech back in... 2005, I think, um, and he tells the story of these two young fish swimming along. It's just an ordinary day in, in the ocean and they, they meet another fish that's swimming the other way who's a bit older, a bit wiser, and the old fish says, morning, boys, how's the water? And the fish kind of keep swimming and look at each other and keep swimming and then one of them eventually puzzled, turns to the other fish, the young fish, and says, what the hell is water? <laughs> and I love it. Because I think a lot of us do swim sort of unconscious or unwoke to yeah. the Obama, you know, to the daily drip of hyperbole or, or you know, day-to-day -day mm. trend by default that we have in our work uh, or, our, or in our life. And so we're sort of unthinking, unblinking, just swimming along, mm. uh, you know, and, and not really understanding um, 
you know, maybe the, the organisational intent or what we can do to yes. actualise yes. actualize our talents or yep. our ideas to help that organisation move toward a bigger goal. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's partly the job of the organisation is to cascade that knowledge, not in a waterfall way, but actually in a way where everybody's town hauling, everybody's responsible, deeply, emotionally and actually invested in the North Star of the company. And, and this is the intrinsic motivation yeah. that you're talking about. This is exactly right. Like you go, you 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 want to find the answer, and you won't stop until you find it. Exactly, and that's not leading with. I don't know. You don't need to sell them a, a dream, but it's yeah. not. It's taking away the leadership that is with fear or with force. Yeah. Um, and allowing you know really building that culture for what is this new reality that we're living and working and learning in, and then how do we adapt or adopt um, new practices that allow us to, to do that well because all of us are trying to shape shift around the new world we find ourselves in. Yeah. And so um, how, do, how do companies uh, do that in a way that is inclusive? Yeah. That's a really great point. And that's the last thing that we need at the moment is fear being driven inside organisations. I think there's enough, enough everywhere else. With the time we've got left, I'm just questions I'm dying to ask around, which is where we even started at the beginning when I did your bio. So we're talking about, you know, Girl World's still running. You've got Future Amp up for girls, quite a lot going on. Tell us how, how are you doing, how, what are your productivity hacks? Let's just cut straight to us. Well, can I just qualify by saying no man ever get that question? I'm happy to. No, work. not about the, not about your girls. Sorry, I didn't mean no, about your girls. No, just more, just generally. Like I have noticed, okay. and this is totally not because you're a busy person. But I've noticed how many times I, I get asked, like, "How do I do it? How do yeah. I do?" I didn't want it to be phrased as well as like a "How does she do it?" question. It's not. It's just that it's like what you know. What are your ways of because we all that. have ours exactly. Yeah. You know, yeah. like yeah. it's like you're a high functioning person. How do you keep on top of stuff and give stuff the dedicated time that it the deserves? Time. But right. no, I agree. It's the one where it's you weaving in, you've got the kids. That's like, that's the rubbish. It's both mine because we've both got kids and we actually need to destigmatize the fact that we're actually parents. Shock yeah. horror. Um, <laughs> so anyway, may I say the most successful entrepreneurs, um, all the data has been released recently, are 47. Um, really? So the age of a successful entrepreneur is 47. Yep. Wow. Um, and I'm not saying, you know, uh, yeah, being, being more than that, that this perception that it's, you know. That I important. am in the sweet spot. This yeah, exactly. <laughs> heading, heading, toward, heading toward menopause. Um, <laughs> so how do I do it? Look, drop balls like everybody, mm. um, like everybody. And, and it's a constant process of, you know, a jumble and tumble of life and work all rolled into one. I think because I started my life, uh, my origin story is, you know, as a journalist. So I trained yeah. with Herald Sun, was at Channel 9 for a while. So I had a very autonomous I suppose um set of skills already because you're always on the sniff for a story and you're juggling lots of things and so you've got a lot of autonomy so I probably came into my working life with that so I've always known what it feels like to juggle projects set my own cadence and my own yeah. um milestones if you like um uh, so probably that helps I think yeah. in terms of being able to manage yourself um I'm really lucky I've got a home a great home studio or office that's here so I've got a few desks in here. Uh, Pre-COVID, colleagues could work from here a few days a week and I'm able to then merge my work and life. Um, I do set aside time for deep work. I actually yeah. brought the little book. Oh, good. You know, I've never read that, actually. Oh, it's really great. I've read Flow, which I, I love, know. which I love changed it. my life. But no, I yeah. need to read that too. A lot of people talk about that one. Okay, that's a that's three book quotes. I'm going to make sure we get all these in the um, comments for everyone. Yeah. Oh, and here's the, here's the other one when we're talking about intrinsic and extrinsic. Oh, I love Dan Pink. Dan Pink's great around that. Yeah. So I've read that to get tips. Mm -hmm. But the, the idea of deep work, I realised I needed to carve into my day because when you are juggling a number of, you know, companies or projects or, and kids and whatnot, um, finding a time to own your time is a challenge. And so instead of being pinged and dinged and mm. all of those things all day, really carving out time to be intentional around what am I going to do for the day. So I've got a, like a, always, you know, notebooks and I'll have use certain colour coding and things to work out what my priorities are for the day. I've learned to write a shorter rather than a longer list per day. Mm. It's sort of to trick myself into thinking that I'm incredibly efficient if I can put a line for each of those things. Um, but working out the systems that work for me around that. One of the things um, that I do is I 
get up in the morning and I put on, uh, I put on, it's like nature music. Uh, it's a quiet space. I've got green trees outside um, and I will light a candle or it sounds a bit woo-woo. I'm not actually that woo-woo, but, um, but I, like I, a light, woo-woo. I light, yeah. I light um, oils actually, eucalyptus mm-hmm. um, oil to start the day and then I'll light some other candles through the day just based on my energy and my mood if I'm spending a long day in front of the screen. Um, and, you know, like I think productivity hacking is a big thing that people talk about now and I'm not interested in getting up at 4.30 in the morning to do, you know, an hour of journaling and an hour of yoga and then some like, you know, whatever, salt smelling. Um, (laughs) That's fine if people do that but my intent with the start of the day is to just anchor myself in my own body Mm. and in my own self, recognise and acknowledge how I'm feeling, whether that's stressed or chill or whatever. And And then from there move through into my set of tasks. And one of the things that I do not do is bang straight into emails and fire mm. those off. Um, it's a really poor way to start the day for me, I find. Yeah. I'm being, being really reactive. Um, I really try and carve out at least the first hour to do eat the frog, mm. uh, do the thing that you don't want to do, or do a task that requires a bit more deep thinking and sort of use that 1% rule where you go, this task is massive, I cannot tackle this, but if I just do 1% of that today and add those up over time, I'll get to the end of it. So that's worked really well, the deep work principle for me. Um, and then I think um, it's sort of about priorities and organisation. So because things are fast moving um, in my work and sometimes in my, my family's life, I need to know when to take something off or out mm. of the car. And so that's constantly sort of adjusting your cadence or your commitments or your priorities and realities depending on what's happening in our lives so part of that's casting off um, perfectionism and thinking I have to see something through Um, letting stuff go is as important as taking stuff on and I've learned Mm. that the hard way I think I used to be a really massive yes person Um, and Mm. I've whilst I'm involved in lots of different things um, I still have a pretty clear sense of what's in my pie and um, and try and really you know, work toward making sure I've got, I, I, and I don't know that you will ever have balance because the mm. life I've chosen to live running companies and whatnot, is, it's not balanced per se, but yeah. I certainly get a lot of time for downtime, for reading, love podcasts, um, you know, sitting in the bath, hanging out with fam and friends mm. and stuff like that, and I get a lot of energy from the world at large and um, that's really important to um, nurture me as a person, but also inform the way I show up in my life and work. Yeah. And has lockdown changed this for you? This I've, given you a bit more of that? Yeah, mm-hmm. I've found lockdown, um, I mean, we've been in a really intense build phase yeah. of, of future amps, so that's sort of been a, well, lockdown has enabled us to really focus on that without having to put energy out into the world through co-locating into offices or yeah. changing kids around and stuff. So in a way I've been able to be really focused uh, on the program of work in that company. Um, and I don't think we would have got to where we were unless we were locked in our houses um, and getting rigor mortis on our chairs. Um, so uh, I think COVID, like many people, it's been this big kind of reset. It's, I know it's fallen too well in many ways and I want to acknowledge first the devastation that has played out in the economy where people have actually lost livelihoods or people they love um, yeah. or, or, you know, or their jobs. So that's... I acknowledge that before saying I'm in an incredibly privileged position whereby our market opportunity has grown through COVID because we're building an education product for the world as it is now. Um, and I have found COVID a real catalyst, like this sort of renaissance mm. where there's a constraint brings creativity. I mean, that's one of the first principles of innovation, right? Yeah. And I've seen incredible proof points and case points of people who've done amazing things, you know, written books and launch books, you know, started companies, um, built teams, um, you know, all sorts of cool shit, like, and mm. solutions that they've spun up where, where you see businesses, hospitality businesses that have spun up and pivoted um, different, like, it's amazing yeah. how adaptable people mm-hmm. are. And, you know, Darwin said the the most adaptable kind of mm. are the ones who are going to survive. And I think um, some people haven't been out of adapt because their business simply wouldn't allow for it. Mm. Uh, and I acknowledge that in, in that statement as well. But I have found COVID to be a really fascinating time to look at where humanity's at right now and and what will we intentionally take into whatever the world looks like in our mm. new normal or on the other side because we have a choice 
right now at this moment in time to say we have this really unique moment to redesign our systems, redesign what work looks like, Mm -hmm. why would we put on a suit and go back to the office nine to five? All of those things have had these huge, you know, pokes and it will be the courageous organisation like Atlassian, you know, like Shopify who recently announced they're going to get rid of their footprint, um, their mm. brick and mortar footprint, and really reduce that and say that we are fully going to move to autonomous um, distributed organisations. Like we were talking about Matt... Uh, what, um, Matt Mullenweg, who started um, this with, yeah, automatic. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think that's been a really exciting and interesting part of what COVID has forced us to all confront. Yeah. That was 20 years in the future it was going to take to see some of this. You know, but I mean, I think some of the stories you're talking about, we're talking about the big organisations and how they've shifted and we've been looking at a campaign, so we're going to roll out shortly around everyday innovation heroes and just even things that, you know, a local gym has done near us, as you said, cafes and restaurants and just all these incredible stories of how they have adapted and actually grown their customer base as well in some of these times. So Totally, because they need as well. We need that optimism to, you know, to get inspired, and that's again another technique we use in design. Is you know when you aren't feeling that optimistic about the future or your ability to be able to change a potential future, there's always that opportunity to look at where other people are doing it. That analogous inspiration, um, and that's you know that's what we we need to fill our own heads with more and um, and each other's, I think, as well. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I completely agree. And I think part of when we think about innovation, a lot of that's that sort of out of the box, that crazy ass thinking that's like, you know, you take yourself to the far edges of ridiculous in order to move back to, if not middle, somewhere further than you would have taken yourself if you'd just done a small shift yeah. or incremental shift. And um, I was actually in a online um, workshop session with Tina Seelig, who's a Stanford professor, who does a lot of work around innovation and, um, and ideation yesterday. And she um, she had a great little activity she did with, with us, which was where you're trying to come up with a solution to a problem or a hypothesis that you've defined, come up with the absolute worst. Yeah. Like right the, yeah. Come up with the, like the, the most stupid like dumb ideas and it was so good to see everyone getting those dumb ones out of the system yep. but some of the dumb ones ended up being ones that you could flip the coin and yes. they made it. and so I think yep. it's really interesting to push our thinking and let ourselves go um, to that range of you know from the, the the ridiculously out of the box to the worst thing you can think of mm. and allow ourselves to go there because often in a meeting or in a team people are a bit afraid to share their ideas definitely so think, why are we working like this why do I have to stamp that thing why am I going through 15 steps when I could just go straight to, to there? Mm. So really challenging the ridiculousness of some of the ways that we think work should work is, yeah. is part of this process of, of refining it and making work more human. Yeah. And that's a big a big part of leadership you've just spoken about there, creating psychological safety for people to be able to share what actually may be a ridiculous idea, even if it's related to something that they're doing. That's totally. the biggest fear most people have is, yep. you know, and it's you know, it's actually related to our fear of social exclusion, death and being kicked out of the community, just putting our hand up with the wrong thing. And and I feel like it's easy even, you know, for us to talk about it in this way. But I remember even early career, this is something that, you know, was truly suffocating was the concept of, put you know, putting a solution forward that and you might be wrong about something that was binary but the idea about putting something forward that was an actual new idea that people hadn't thought of was utterly terrifying. Yeah, and, and as you would well know, the context and where we see the work of, of, of IDEO or, or companies like yours, that the context within which you're prepared to dare mm. really yeah. important. And so where we yeah. see things like stimulants, you know, on a table uh, or artefacts or even, you know, often people do this in off-sites because it's important that we get, if there's a culture which is not permitting that um, and there's not a safe kind of culture, then it's important that we um, create an environment where people are prepared to share. And that's where we see so many um, tangible things that are used in the innovation process because it helps people to unlock or unleash that that uh, that inside um, that they're mm. keeping off the way a lot of the time. Yeah. With um, Matt, uh, with Matt Mullenberg's work, uh, that five levels of autonomy. Mm. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this. So where we've seen workplaces have to distribute and go remote yeah. through COVID and some of them, you know, kicking and screaming have had to do that yeah. or weren't um, digitised enough to manage actually that transition 
effectively. Yeah. Um, so Matt talks about the five levels and level zero, where a lot of companies are at, is where you do a job which can't be done unless you're physically there. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes there are jobs where you're in the service industry or you're digging a mine or whatever you're doing. Where Manufacturing, yeah. Correct, I get that. Yeah. But there's some jobs where they say, we don't believe you can do your job unless we have your bum on the seat. Yeah. To show that you're nine to fiving. Mm. So we've seen some of those companies have to move very quickly to a system where they can't have oversight the whole time on their employees. And so what does trust look like in the new? Then level two is that companies are making a deliberate effort to make make things remote friendly. Mm. So we're seeing that shift actually. There's been some maturity uh, where there's so much on LinkedIn and so many webinars around, okay, how are we going to make this work remotely and how to make people feel connected and not lonely or digitally punished all day on their screens and we know people are working a lot longer during COVID. Okay. Um, level two is everything is still synchronous mm-hmm. but your day is completely full of interruptions. Yeah. Well, Which is where mo- this is where even companies who feel high functioning at the moment, that's the where we're seeing most people operate and Zoom is a perfect kind of uh, enabler but an also a massive blocker when Correct. it comes to this sort of this constant pinging of being always available all day, you just mentioned deep work as well, the inability to actually get the work that you need to get work done. Correct. And I... And it's still presenteeism, but just digital presenteeism because I still want to see your light on and I still want to be able to access you just like you were sitting over there, which also was a bad way of working anyway. When you're all in the office and any kind of stream of consciousness, we just quickly ask the person around it. It feels like collaboration, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's just vomiting on an interruption. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I think you're right. I think the something around the presenteeism that we need to work through around that and that's a trust thing. Um, yeah. And that's a, is it a time-based metric we're pulling or a value-based metric we're pulling? Totally. And I think that's super interesting. Level three is being remote first or distributed. Mm-hmm. So really embedding deeply that we are going to, cope with the fact that our workforce doesn't have to get together in the real uh, in real time. Level four is when you're truly asynchronous, we can work across geographies, time zones, business yeah. functions, and we have some source of truth. Then you need a really robust way to yeah. communicate and cascade um, project information in order to get that visibility uh, if you're all working, you know, in a uh, not in a synchronised way. And then Nirvana, which mm. is presumably what you work like, um, I was about to say, I actually think we're pretty close to level four thanks to Zoom, um, Mural now and Productive, another tool we use for our Kanban. But nice. Mm, All right. Here's yeah. what we're working toward, also us. <laughs> level five, according to, to the five levels of autonomy, yeah. is called Nirvana. It's where you consistently perform better than any in-person organisation in the world. Yes, which would be Envision. Envision would be like probably the gold standard of organize because they have been very quiet even through a lot of this and they were an organization that were doing this beforehand. So Matt Mullen we kind of bla- blazed the trail with automatic WordPress, then automatic. And then um, and Envision have done it. They have you, you, there is no there are no Envision offices um, and they sell design systems. So they genuinely practice what they preach. They will. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting. Mm. I mean, I do wonder about, you've spent so much time with teams and that human dynamic that needs to touch, feel, see, sense, smell, you know, get those intuitions. What do you think about, like, if we distribute people all together and have, like, literally complete virtual workforces, what happens to the moments in the real where you see fundamental? I think it still need to come together, but you'll just come together for really intentional reasons. Um, and I don't think this is a groundbreaking thought. I think this is what people are commonly discussing at the moment. It'll be, you know, I think I think the Nirvana is doing, this is, goes for our team as well, and we're having the same conversation. We get, we have our days where we are doing our in-depth work, your four-hour blocks or your whole time when you've got to produce things. You may do, we work in an asynchronous way, so we might kick something off, say, in the mural board, you'll be working on this, I'll be working on this. Everyone separates, works for three hours, comes back together, shares, outputs, where do we go next is what that looks like. And then physically, if you want to come together, it's about coming together for genuine collaboration. And so, so how not communication, share? not cooperation. How then do you come together? Oh, so when you share, when you talk about coming together with the mural, so yep. can you 
talk talk that through? Like, is that satisfactory as a kind of a yes? I know oh so much more satisfying because you you also know where work is. Like one of the most unsatisfying things I used to find was you just go from meeting to meeting to meeting. That was my corporate career as well as even times at Naked. We go from thing to thing to thing to thing. And then you're writing things on whiteboards and we would be in, you know, co-working spaces or even, you know, when you're in offices, same thing. Then someone's got to take it down, put it somewhere, action it. And it's usually left to one person, you know, that they've got to do this. Um, And in really hierarchical organisations, it's going to be the lowest paid person in the room that's got to take away all that information and bang it all together. And that's not collaborative either because then it leaves room for misinterpretation. It leaves room for confusion around ownership. Then it's about that culture of we're going to schedule the next meeting for the next meeting for the next thing and it just rolls into one. Whereas this is, you know, we, we set up really intentional, you know, what is the context of this session from anything that's 60 minutes to six months long what's the context what's the objective what's the purpose um so what's the process who are the people and where is the environment and whoever's running it goes through all of those things really quickly at the top of it then we execute on them and then we check ourselves off around have we reached this objective what other information do we need how do we bring something in when does the client come in and it's just about using people's time super efficiently like we don't need to run a whole one day thing with this client for this part of the design we just need their input here yeah let's give them some homework to do so they can play that back to us and then we know how to act so it's really in terms of accountability visibility and action I find the virtual workspaces and whiteboarding is oh the dream right I mean for priority yeah it sounds like you've got some great systems in place for prioritization and accountability yeah and then um sometimes so where I've worked in teams where uh, you know, it's a constant challenge, isn't it, of getting visibility of workflow or work streams and then um, memo shifting priorities. And so things like Slack. So love Slack. You Slack for a bunch of different things. But we have to have some rules around Slack as well because that can turn into its own chattering parrots in trees. Yeah. And so, yes, we can use threads and we can say you must put at the top of what, you know, put a kind of a topic at the top mm. of, of your comment and, and don't just blah, 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 blah. Like if you're going to say something, think about it, construct it and put it in a nice yeah. kind of neat way. Not to take the conversation out of what's happening there, but that's been important. Um, we use a lot of different tools and I think sometimes what I've seen, certainly with us and then with uh, when I've worked inside organisations, is there's too many. Too many. And then yeah. how do we duplicate? Oh, I forgot to put move yeah. the Trello board no. and now that happened and that happened. It's like... Yeah. How many is too many? I think we've got a bit obsessed with collaboration and work. Completely. And so what do you take using your team? Yeah. Sorry, I've just flipped it around so much. No. Well, this like, is the thing because it's, and that's the question of the E, which is environment, is like where, what tool is really, truly going to service? And we, and this isn't, you, there's no quick fix for this. This is going into them and using different ones. But again, we, we used to use Trello and then it'd be some stuff was living over in Trello and then we were kind of trying to use Trello as a project management tool, which was just a disaster doesn't work, wasn't happening. So now we're down to one, um, one software, which is it's called Productive. It's got a Kanban in it. It's also agency management. So you can manage all your clients, you know, what, what is the project looking like? What are we up to? All of those kind of inputs and outputs. And you can actually share that with them as well. So if you have that relationship, that's helpful. Um, and then pretty much our whole lives, like if I bought up our mural screen now, you'd just be like, boom, I can share this with you and anyone else who's listening as well wants it, <laughs> our best of. But the team were, I think there must be 100 boards in there that have been created over the last maybe six months. And they're for all different purposes and all the projects. Everyone's totally clear on what's in there, why they're invited, how they're invited, what their contribution is. And we're still perfecting this. We're not totally you know, on top of it, but it is about even using those sorts of mindsets that we talk about with clients around like, what is the experiment that we're running with this? Like, what is the thing that we need to learn about the way that we're working and how can we reflect and perfect on that? So we have a design meeting once a week where we may actually talk about tools, for example, like the way that we're using this is not working for me. The way that we're constantly interrupting each other isn't working. How do we find our way around doing that? But short answer to the tool question, we operate in just three now. So we have um, for everything that's sort of project managey and then um, recording hours and those sorts of things is, and plus the Kanban, so that's daily. The Kanban also has one top layer on the Kanban, which is to your point before around if you've got more than four priorities, you 
you're not going to do anything. So we have a weekly priorities where under certain categories, we're only allowed two or three things. And Olga and our team is our chief innovation officer really strict on, we, we can't keep doing this. So there'll be like the delivery priorities, the marketing priorities, and maybe some related to BD and team. And then that's it. So anything else just has to get pushed or we do have to force rank ourselves on a Monday about what's going to get done that week. Then it gets broken down into all the other different Kanbans, which is project-based Kanbans. Does that involve self-flagellation or whipping? We do it to each other. So it's like team accountability. So there's a stand-up every morning at 9 and then a stand-up every afternoon at 4 and they go for 30 minutes. So it's, you know, it's kind of riffing, gagging, all those kinds of things, which is usually 10 minutes and then it's down to business, boom, and we review the weekly ones every single day, but we don't tick them off. We just say, this is what we're doing this week. So it's top of everyone's mind. How do you move your big rocks for the week? And then we go into the daily ones. And then when we're doing the project work, we're over in mural. And then when we're talking to each other, we're in Slack or we call each other. And mm-hmm. Zoom, of course. And then who, with those stand-ups then, do you have a designated person who's like the racing model who's going to run that stand-up and keep you to the agenda? Yep. As set? Do you have an agenda that you put forward for each of them? Not an agenda for each of them. So we just kind of move things across into you to do's to done the standard sort of things. Um, Parika in our team is a service designer and she's just taken that on herself. So that's sort of her leadership, which is awesome. She's super organised. It really suits everyone. That's kind of she, lo- she likes it. We like it. I hope she likes it. <laughs> um, and, then, and then everyone contributes. So you only talk to your cards. So when your card's the next one in line, you talk to that and then you move it across. Um, And it took like a bit of work, even for us, you know, we were doing this in the office, but again, it's better virtual. It's, you can see things and I only operate on the Kanban now. So there's no, I have a big desk I scribble on here, which has got big bits of butcher's paper on it, but my Kanban is my source of truth. Um, And everybody else is aware of what you're doing as well. And then up from those weekly priorities, we use the Rockefeller habits um, strategy, which is your, you know, your annual goals and then your monthly rocks. So then everyone creates those monthly rocks together and then the monthly rocks get broken down into weeklies and then everything gets moved on. Yeah, it sounds like. Have you read Atomic Habits? I haven't actually. Yeah. 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 I, I know everyone was um, crazy about that, but I've never, yeah, I've never read that. But I'm sure it's just a mishmash of all these other things. That, well, it is. And, I, and it's the rocks kind of thing, break it into yeah. little rocks. And, you know, the more little rocks that you can bind together day by day the bigger the rock is and suddenly you've done the thing um so it's pretty logical it's just bloody hard to do it when you think about behavioral shift you know and if you're trying to tackle a really big thing then it's a way to hack it down into small measurable you know yes smart smart goals or yeah 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 Yeah. oh well we've covered a lot we're over we're over an hour and 15 minutes so um i have to say there has been at times in this conversation that i kind of forgot that we were recording something or we were live which i think is a really good sign of a combo especially <laughs> people aren't sleeping Gosh. a lot of fun so fun we have um, covered a lot yeah amazing Mads. is there anything i haven't asked you that you wanted to talk about no, I think we've pretty we've riffed pretty we've done much. It. Yeah. Startups, parenting, innovation, productivity, the yeah. new world. We haven't found the cure for for COVID, uh, <laughs> but uh, even if that's not going to come anytime soon, I don't think we wait for that to the mo- for the moment to yes. say we're actually living through what normal is right now. And yeah. so, how do we better live, work, and learn in our new reality? Love it. Beautiful closing comments. So, Mads, you have shared with us a couple of links as well, your LinkedIn and your personal website. We'll pop all of those on if you're happy for people to reach out to you and get in touch. For everyone out there, make sure you keep an eye out for the amazing Future Amp, especially if you are 15 to 25 or you know someone close to you who is. I'm sure they would be, um, will be loving the platform when it's live. So thanks so much again, Mads, um, and have a beautiful rest of the day. Thanks, Fiona. Great to chat. <laughs> See you. See you. Bye.